In this lecture, we're going to look at the lymphatic drainage of the abdominopelvic organs. So I haven't really mentioned the lymphatic system throughout the lectures so far, and I wanted to deal with it just in one lecture. But each of the organs that we've spoken about will have a specific lymphatic drainage. And the lymphatic system is actually part of the circulatory system, and it consists of a network of lymphatics. Lymphatic vessels, nodes, and lymphatic organs, like the spleen, are responsible for draining excessive tissue fluid, which is known as lymph. So we're going to have a look at the basic components of the lymphatic system briefly first, and then we'll have a general overview of the lymphatic drainage before picking up individual organs and their lymphatic drainage. So what we can see are just two cartoons which really just summarise the lymphatic system with lymph nodes, with efferent and afferent lymphatic vessels. And these lymph nodes are important in filtering out particles in the lymphatic fluid, filtering out debris that's a result of excessive tissue fluid and the activity of the cells. They're a small filtering system running throughout the body. So what we can see is that this lymphatic system is formed by a series of these small lymphatic plexuses or capillaries, and these are found within intercellular spaces. So the spaces in and around the cells find these lymphatic capillaries. And these can merge with larger lymphatic vessels, and we have afferent and efferent vessels. Just like we can see here, we have an afferent vessel we can see passing into a lymph node, we can see the afferent lymph vessels passing into this opened up lymph node here. So it has multiple afferent lymph vessels coming into it. And then here within the lymph node, we have some lymphocytes that can help to combat some of this debris, help to filter out some of the debris that's found within the lymphatic fluid, within the lymph. And then this filtered lymph can then pass out via an efferent lymphatic vessel. And this can pass to more lymph nodes as it's passing throughout the body. So these lymph nodes contain lymphocytes and are important in filtering out foreign particles. Metastasizing cancer cells, once they've broken through the basement membrane of their organ can also travel through the lymphatic system and these lymph nodes can also filter out these cancer cells and detection of cancer cells in lymph nodes can indicate that the cancer was actually spread. Throughout the body we have various aggregates of lymphoid tissue, we have larger lymph nodes essentially and these occur at the spleen and the thymus gland or payers patches which we spoke about in the gastrointestinal tract within the distal ileum specifically. So we have these lymph nodes that filter the debris, foreign particles and cancer cells that are running through the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system throughout the body is, is vast and they're very small, so the actual vessels themselves, the afferent and efferent vessels, are very difficult to pick up themselves but we can see the lymph nodes in most people, if they become infected or if they become full of lymphocytes that they're busy filtering out lots of debris, then they become swollen. We can see the lymph nodes in the groin, we can see some in the neck, but they're really associated with lots of organs and we have a high number of lymph nodes within the abdominopelvic cavity. Ultimately, all of these lymph nodes are going to drain into the thoracic duct. They're going to drain into the thoracic duct, which we can see here. It runs next to the esophagus within the thoracic cavity, and it actually drains into the junction between the left subclavian and internal jugular veins. Now, the vast majority of the lymph from the body is going to be draining into the thoracic duct. And this diagram actually shows it nicely. All of the body that's covered in this kind of pinkish shading is one way or another going to drain into the thoracic duct.
Only this upper right quadrant of the body doesn't, and that drains via the right lymphatic duct. But the vast majority of it is passing through the thoracic duct into this region here, the junction of the left subclavian and the internal jugular veins. Now, we're concentrating on the gastrointestinal tract, and lymph from the gastrointestinal tract drains into what are known as pre-aortic lymph nodes. These pre-aortic lymph nodes are positioned anterior to the aorta, pre aortic. And they're associated with the three unpaired arteries. So we have the celiac trunk, we have the celiac lymph nodes, we have the superior mesenteric artery, we have superior mesenteric lymph nodes, we have inferior mesenteric artery, we have inferior mesenteric lymph nodes. And ultimately, if we remember, the foregut, the midgut, and the hindgut are served by these blood vessels then the lymph from those organs will go to the respective lymph nodes. So the foregut will pass to the celiac lymph nodes. The midgut will pass to the superior mesenteric lymph nodes. And organs within the hindgut will pass to the inferior mesenteric lymph nodes. Efferent lymphatic vessels from these, from these nodes form what are known as intestinal lymphatic trunks. And these ascend up the body, and ultimately will converge to form the cisterna chile. And this occurs around about L1, L2 level. We also have organs which are retroperitoneal, and we have the pelvic organs, which are not associated with the peritoneum, they're subperitoneal. These still give rise to lymph, and these drain into what are known as right and left lumbar lymphatic trunks. These are the same principle as the intestinal lymphatic trunks, except they come from those retroperitoneal organs. They come from the pelvic organs. Ultimately, the lumbar lymphatic trunks and the intestinal lymphatic trunks unite to form the cisterna chile, which is this dilation around about L1, L2. It really is quite variable in the individual. A curve around about here, receiving the intestinal, receiving the lumbar lymphatic trunks from the cisterna chile. It then is continuous through the diaphragm and it then runs through the thorax as the thoracic duct, which opens up into the left subclavian and the internal jugular veins, the junction of those. So let's have a look at the specific lymphatic drainage from various organs. And here we can see we're looking at on this side the organs within the foregut. So we're looking at the spleen, we're looking at the stomach, we're looking at part of the esophagus, part of the duodenum. The liver's not detailed here but we've got um, the hepatic artery which would go towards the liver. And we can see that surrounding surrounding the celiac trunk which we can find here we have a collection of lymph nodes and these will be known as our celiac lymph nodes our celiac lymph nodes which are here the lymph vessels and the lymph nodes are dotted along the arteries so if you follow the arteries you'll see these lymph nodes attached to the arteries with their efferent and afferent um, lymphatic vessels associated with them so we can see we have our splenic lymph nodes here taking the efferent taking the afferent lymphatic vessels from the spleen and then these will pass ultimately all the way to the celiac lymph nodes. We have some around the greater curvature, so we have the gastromental lymph nodes. We have some around the lesser curvature, so we have the gastric lymph nodes. We have some around the pylorus, the pyloric lymph nodes. So there's nothing too technical about this, too difficult about this. We just have a series of lymph nodes around the organ the organs in the foregut, so these will go on to pass to the celiac lymph nodes. If we look here on the opposite side, we can see we have in yellow here, we have the hindgut, and we can see in green we have the midgut. We can see these green lymph nodes are all going to pass to the superior mesenteric lymph nodes associated with the superior mesenteric artery. So we see we have right colic lymph nodes. We have iliocolic lymph nodes. We have 
juxta intestinal mesenteric lymph nodes. These are lying next to the intestines, the small intestine. We can see we have some lymph nodes associated with the paracolic region, paracolic lymph nodes, middle colic lymph nodes. But essentially, their efferent lymphatic vessels will pass towards the superior mesenteric lymph nodes. And these, which we can see associated with the superior mesenteric artery, will then run alongside what we have here is an intestinal trunk. The intestinal trunk can then be continuous with the thoracic duct by way of the cisterna chile. We have the same when we're looking at the hindgut. We can see we have mesocolic for the transverse mesocolon. We can see them here. In this case, they're draining into the superior mesenteric lymph nodes. But we could have some left colic lymph nodes here. We can have some down towards the sigmoid colon. And these are draining into the inferior mesenteric lymph nodes. These will then ascend up alongside the aorta as intestinal trunks and they'll aggregate with other intestinal trunks, the left and right, to form the cisterna chile. The cisterna chile, as we'll see later on, will receive the lumbar lymphatic trunks and then we have the thoracic duct. Here we can look at actual the liver, we can look at the pancreas and spleen in a little bit more detail, but because these are ultimately associated with the foregut, then again they will pass to the celiac lymph nodes around the celiac trunk. Celiac lymph nodes around the celiac trunk, passing from the splenic lymph nodes along the splenic artery towards it. Here we can see we've got hepatic lymph nodes associated with the liver and they'll pass back towards the celiac trunk. Pancreaticoduodenal lymph nodes, and these will pass towards the celiac trunk. Obviously, we have this transition where we have the superior and inferior pancreaticoduodenal arteries coming from the celiac trunk or the superior mesenteric artery. So we'll have some of these lymph nodes passing into the superior mesenteric lymph nodes. These, as previously, will aggregate and ascend as intestinal trunks. Here we can now move on to the posterior abdominal wall and the pelvic viscera. Now these don't merge into intestinal trunks. They merge into lumbar trunks. And what we can see here in the female is we have a whole series of other lymph nodes. We can see in the female we have the uterus here, we can see we have the vagina here, we can see we have the rectum behind. And we can see that depending on where we are positioned, these are going to move into the internal iliac lymph nodes, or they're going to move into the external iliac lymph nodes. We also have superficial inguinal lymph nodes, and we have deep inguinal lymph nodes. So we can see that the vagina is passing into this deep inguinal lymph nodes whereas the skin of the labia is passing into the superficial inguinal lymph nodes. The superficial become continuous with the deep as they follow their path back up towards the common iliac lymph nodes. These then ascend as our lumbar trunks. If we look at the uterus, we can see the uterus is going to pass into the we can see the uterus is going to pass into the internal iliac lymph nodes, but these ultimately then run into the external and common iliac lymph nodes, and these will ascend. So we have specific locations where these lymph nodes from specific organs pass to, but ultimately they all end up aggregating together as they ascend upwards. We can see these lumbar lymph nodes are then running up, sitting either side of the kidney. That was in the female. In the male, we can see we have a similar arrangement. We can see that the lymph nodes associated with the internal iliac artery, we can see here, these look like they're receiving their lymph from the prostate, from the seminal vesicles. We can see that the testes. The testes are an important example, because if you can follow the pathway of the testes, you'll see that its lymph is actually running all the way up into these lumbar lymph nodes. And that's indicative of the 
movement, the migration the testes did during development. Because if you look, if you look where the skin of the scrotum is, this is passing into the superficial and into the deep inguinal or lymph nodes, which we can see, which we can see here and here. So although the testes is within the scrotum and they're very adjacent in their position, they actually have a very different lymphatic drainage. The skin we can see is draining into the superficial inguinal lymph nodes. We can see the skin of the penis is draining into the deep inguinal lymph nodes. And we can see the testes are actually passing all the way up and draining into the lumbar lymph nodes. This is really important if you're considering removing a testy due to testicular cancer. It's important that if the testicle is cancerous and it has the potential for metastasizing tumor cells, then you want to limit the removal of the testy to a region which has a similar lymphatic drainage. So what you don't want to do is really take it out via the scrotum. Because if you did, you would be interfering with these superficial inguinal lymph nodes and you could be spreading them into this system. So it's often best to try and take them out maybe via the anterior abdominal wall rather than taking them out through the skin of the scrotum. So in summary, you can, and we'll go through the specific lymphatic drainage of the organs in a few slides time, but even if you just take home this kind of general summary of the lymphatic drainage, ultimately everything is going to end up in the renal system at the junction between the left internal jugular and subclavian veins. And to do that, it runs within the thoracic duct, which is continuous with the cisterna chile. We can see the cisterna chile here, this dilated um, sac, and then it's going to pass up as the internal sorry, as the thoracic duct through the thorax. But we can see that we have these pre-aortic intestinal lymphatic trunks, and we, these are draining the organs of the gastrointestinal tract. So these are coming from the GI tract, the specific pyloric lymph nodes, hepatic lymph nodes, splenic lymph nodes. Pick the organ, work out if it's foregut, midgut, hindgut, and ultimately it will pass to that lymph node around that main arterial supply. And then we have the retroperitoneal and pelvic organs, and these pass one way or another into the lumbar lymphatic trunks. These run either side of the aorta, so they're known as power aortic lymph nodes. These two converge to form the cisterna chile, which as we've said, passes ultimately via the thoracic duct into the venous system. So we've got a few tables now which really can serve as reference for how these organs give rise to their lymphatic blood vessels and how they ultimately end up into the thoracic duct. So we can see we've got the stomach passes into a whole series of lymph nodes associated with the stomach, but ultimately it passes into the celiac lymph node. Duodenum, jejunum, ileum, the cecum, various parts of the colon, all part of the midgut. So these will ultimately, by way of their various lymph nodes, pass into the superior mesenteric lymph nodes. And then the descending and sigmoid colon, the superior aspect of the rectum, will pass, because they're associated with the hindgut, into the inferior mesenteric lymph nodes. These will all pass via the intestinal lymphatic trunks up to the cisterna chile. If we carry on and look at the specific organs, then organs such as the pancreas, the spleen, the liver and gallbladder, these are associated with primarily the foregut, with the pancreas, remember we had a bit of um, superior mesenteric blood supply, so these are going to pass to the respective lymph nodes, celiac primarily, as I said, a little bit of superior mesenteric for the head and the uncinate process of the pancreas. And these will pass, because they're part of the gastrointestinal tract, to the intestinal lymphatic trunks. If we then look at the 
kidneys, suprarenal glands, ureters, that lie retroperitoneal. Then the kidneys will pass to the lumbar lymph nodes via some lymphatic vessels, as will the suprarenal glands. The ureters, along their course, will drain in as they follow the posterior abdominal wall, and they'll pass into lumbar lymph nodes, maybe via the internal, external, common iliac, but ultimately passing into the lumbar lymph nodes, and these go on to the lumbar trunks. Quite separate, these para-aortic lymph nodes, quite separate from the pre-aortic. Look into the pelvis bladder, the superior part of the bladder, the fundus may be slightly different with internal iliac, but the ductus deferens, the seminal vesicles, the prostate, all drain into the internal iliac. The scrotum, as I mentioned previously, that is going to drain into the superficial inguinal. The testes within the scrotum are going to be different because of their origin up near the kidney on the posterior abdominal wall. The lymphatic drainage was already established when they're developing, so it went into the lumbar just like the kidneys. So even though it's within the scrotum, it passes to a different lymphatic region. Superficial inguinal, internal iliac, pass to the external iliac, common iliac, and these then form the lumbar trunks. Para-aortic lymph nodes. In the female, we've got the vagina, we've got the uterus, these pass into internal, external iliac. These will ultimately go on to the common iliac. The ovaries and the uterine tubes. Remember, the ovaries took a similar course to the testes. They didn't end up passing through the uterine tube, through the inguinal canal, sorry. But they did actually migrate down. And before that migration, the lymph was established. So similar to the testes, they passed into the lumbar. We've then got the rectum, the inferior part of the rectum, and the superior part of the um, inguinal, of the um, anal canal, and these are passing into the internal iliac. Inferior passes into a separate lymphatic system. It passes into the superficial inguinal because it's associated with the surface of the skin. Just like the scrotum, the skin via the pectinate line, inferior to the pectinate line, drains into a different location. Ultimately, though, they're all aggregating to the same place, so our external, common, and then into the lumbar trunks. So you can, depending on how much you need to know, you can look at the specific lymphatic drainage for the specific organ, or you can understand that retroperitoneal and subperitoneal pelvic organs drain into these lumbar, whereas organs of the gastrointestinal tract will drain into the intestinal. And that's really what the conclusion is. We looked at the various components of the lymphatic system, the plexuses, vessels and nodes, briefly at the beginning. And then we had a general overview of these intestinal lymphatic trunks and the lumbar trunks. We talked about them coalescing to form the cisterna chile and then passing up through the diaphragm as the thoracic duct. Thoracic duct then passing in to the vena system at the junction of the left jugular vein and the left subclavian vein. We talked about drainage from individual organs, so we mentioned the celiac, superior mesenteric, inferior mesenteric, similar to the arterial distribution, and we spoke about inguinal, superficial or deep, iliac, common, external, internal, and lumbar lymph nodes.